I'm Joanna Calabrese, the president of BBA Club of LA. Uh, happy summer. So yay, the summer solstice was yesterday. And I think you all know this, but the club in LA is made up of alumni and students, family and friends. And our real goal is to engage the LA community and do great stuff as a UVA kind of family. Um, we do social charitable events. Obviously this one's educational. Um, we have an event coming up on July 9th that's with the Marine Mammal Care Center where we're doing a beach cleanup in San Pedro, which we've done a couple of times. So just sharing some great events that we have. Um, but we're all here tonight because Katja, our alumni, has written a great book. So Katja graduated at UVA in 2015, and then she got her master's from GMU in organizational development and knowledge management. And ever since she's been in LA, which I believe is about three years now, um, she wrote a fantastic book called Joy in Plain Sight, which is so fitting for the very difficult two years we all just kind of survived through. And I liked the subtitle of your book, Stories and Essays Celebrating Wonder in the Ordinary, which I think is just like, duh, why don't we recognize this? And I think this book talk will really help us kind of think about it and kind of figure out our own practice of joy. Um, I'm also going to share in the chat this great UVA article that came out a few months ago on Katya and then um, a link to the book, which you can get on Amazon through Kindle or in paperback. So with that, I'll let Katya kick it off. Thank you, Joanna, for that warm and kind welcome. Friends, just as a little bit of housekeeping, if you want to see one another in a sort of Brady Bunch perspective, go ahead and look at the top right corner of your screen that says view. It's that little waffle and click on gallery mode so that we're able to see one another all in this Brady Bunch group uh, orientation. And in order to warm up our voices to really my goal is to make this a conversation. I would love to hear your voices either vocally or in the chat to make this more of a dialogue versus me just being in the spotlight for an hour because who wants to do that? So on the count of three, if you're able to, I invite you to hit that unmute button and to say hello to your fellow UVA family here. Ready? One, two, three. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi. So good to see these beautiful voices. And friends, if you're able to be on camera, would love that just to create that sense of community in the room. If you're not able to, that's A-OK. -okay. I also welcome eating dinner, being in the car, stretching, yoga, handstands, whatever makes you cozy and comfy, because we're here to be human and have a conversation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I am just so delighted and honored to be able to share with you a little bit about the writing journey and a little bit about the perspective of how do we find our own joys in plain sight. Now to begin this conversation, I actually wanna begin with a bit of a reflective activity. So if you're able to in the chat, I'd love for you to share with our group, what's one thing that has made you joyful over the last two or three weeks? It can be big or small, it can be related to work or life, but what one thing made you joyful in the last two to three weeks? I'll give us about 10 seconds or so to think of an answer, drop it in the chat so we can learn from one another here. Joanna loved last night's rain. Yes, for our LA folks, we had rain last night, which was so unexpected and so beautiful. Stanford loved time with family. Danielle scheduled a visit back to the East Coast to see family, lots of family love. Oh, Charlotte's dog is doing so well off the leash. That's always so exciting. Lots of family trips to the Bahamas. Julie, please take me with you. And again, more love for our puppers. Friends, I love starting off this conversation that way because it really illuminates the fact that there is actually a lot of joy all around. And what I hope to dive into today is to really demarcate for ourselves why joy is so important. I'll share a little bit about the writing journey of what it means to be an author. I still, it still feels weird to say I'm a published author, but I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what happened behind the scenes. And then I'd like to share with you something called the treasure hunt framework. That's the main takeaway in order to build a little bit more of that joy-based habits into our own lives. I will leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, but I welcome any questions, interruptions. Feel free to raise your real hand, your digital hand, drop a question in the comment, whatever flows your boat, so we can have that conversation. With that, let's go ahead and dive in. Just to ground us in a little bit of who this person is coming in through your Zoom screen, as Joanna mentioned, went to UVA and Mason. Professionally, I've had the privilege of working across many different industries, such as consulting in higher education at our very own UVA Alumni Association, 
and then most recently in my career iteration in people operations at a couple of tech companies. Currently, I work at Life Labs Learning and actually have a colleague, Tatiana, I want to spotlight you. Thank you for joining. Tatiana and I work together. It's such a delight to see you here. What an unexpected surprise where we really get to train managers, executives, and ICs on life's most important skills in the facet of leadership. So professionally, I really like to ask the question of what makes people thrive at work? Now, folks, the reason that I think this is so important is because if we spend so much of our time working, shouldn't we find joy and meaning and purpose in what we do? I think so, right? Because if we're at work for eight to 10 hours a day, that becomes more than a third of our lives. But if we were to zoom out the scope and not only explore what makes people thrive at work, but instead, what makes people thrive in general? Then that becomes a really interesting mind experiment. How do we find those pockets of thriving in the context of our noisy, busy world, as Joanna mentioned? Now, a little bit of reflection here too. I want you to think about a person in your life who you've thought to yourself, huh, that person's really thriving. Or I want you to think back on your past. Maybe you experienced a time when you were thriving. And in the chat, take about 20 seconds to think and share with us what indicated to you that either that person or you were thriving. What are some of those markers that gave it away that they were in a period where they were thriving? Go ahead and share that with us in the chat. Mm, and folks, take a few moments to scroll up and down. I'll read it out loud for our audio learners. Thriving means people were comfortable in their own skin optimistic, present, had a tangent of laughter, energy, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, competence, receiving praise, being productive, sleeping. Absolutely. That's such an important one. Uh, sleeping is definitely takes the cake, especially in the backdrop of the last year. And folks, when researchers wanted to investigate this concept of thriving, right, they came up with themes very similar to the ones that you named in the chat and certain words arose happiness, relationships, productivity, success. Sleep is not on here, but I think it should be. And what they found is that a lot of people tend to seek happiness, to seek moments of thriving. But happiness is an interesting beast because it's something, according to researchers, that tends to be reflective. It's something that we think, ah, we were happy in that time. Something that we come to evaluate when we think back on our lives. But joy, my friends, is something that's instantaneous. It occurs in the present. It's those little tiny moments where we get to appreciate last night's rain, where we get to appreciate an upcoming trip to the Bahamas, where we get to appreciate the fact that our pupper is doing so incredibly well. So the question then becomes, how do we seek out those tiny moments of joy? How do we plant the seeds of joy to roll up into a life that is full of thriving? Now, isn't that an interesting question to ponder? I used to ponder that too, until this happened. Our dear friend COVID, the thing that changed and turned the entire world on its head. Now, March, 2020, coupled with the economies shutting down, millions dying globally, was a pretty dark time. In fact, the more of that breaking news that we saw, billions dead here, controversial topic here, controversial topic there, augmented with all of the endless notifications, pings, texts, news outlets, screaming their input and their stimulus straight into us. That's overwhelming. That's a recipe for the very opposite of thriving. And so personally for me, as an ordinary person who's also going through the pandemic, our beautiful city of Los Angeles began to actually lose its color. Life as I knew it felt kind of empty. I'll share that also during that time, a month after the pandemic hit, my organization for which I was doing people operations went through a merger. So my uh, sort of the way that I was showing up to work was exactly like this completely burnt out, drained, working 10 to 15 hour workdays, trying to support other people while also trying to navigate my own complexity and the own difficulties. How many of us have felt this way during the pandemic at least once? Yeah, yeah, 
it's a pretty real thing. Julie, I appreciate you raising your hand while you're driving. I see you. I appreciate that effort. And I know we've got Elvin joining us. Elvin, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. So folks, I want to share a little bit of a story where in this season of burnout, I was wondering why was it so hard to actually feel whole? Why was it so hard for me to continue going from one task to the next, from doing full-time work to side projects, to trying to fit in a workout, to trying to maintain my relationships, all while feeling isolated, all while feeling devoid of color? I remember sitting on my driveway. It was sometime in the winter. It was already dark. It was seven o'clock. I was trying to transition from my full work day into starting up another night of more work. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll just do a workout to try to get my head in the game. But I was sitting there and suddenly just burst out crying out of nowhere. I was like, where are these tears coming from? And I felt so depleted that I called my, my partner and I was like, why can't I do a single push up? Like, I genuinely have no gumption, no strength, no emotional capacity to do a single push up, which is something that I've done. You know, I, I tend to work out every day. So it's something that brings me a lot of joy. Burnout. Burnout had set in. And through this cycle of 15 hour days of consistently doing, consistently being on, consistently being stimulated by all of the 24 hour news cycle, what happened is that I became a human doing, less of a human being. Now y'all, this sucked. How many of us have felt the semblance of being a human doing, not a human being? Yeah, so we know what it's like, right? It's the opposite of thriving. It feels really, really bad. And so my first thought, well, I wish I could just escape, wish I could just fly to Cabo, forget all my worries, forget the pandemic existed and live the paradise island life. But of course I couldn't because there's no way the flights were all um, not available. It was just not a feasible thing to do. So it's like, okay, I cannot do a big thing to change my entire life, to change my sort of day-to-day uh, -day living. But what I could do is to continue doing something that I had been since moving to LA, which is go on walks. Now, this is actually a picture of a neighborhood from LA. It's not my neighborhood, but you can see here, I believe that's the, the um, mountain that has the Hollywood sign on it. It looks very much like it. If someone knows where what the location of this is, I would love for you to share in the chat. What I realized is that on my walks, there was a lot of really neat things all around. Maybe it's the pointedness of the little leaves at the top of the tree. Maybe it's the way the mountain sloped to form a perfect 45 degree angle. Maybe it's the whisper of a hummingbird's wings flapping right on by, inadvertently saying hello. And so I began trying to pay attention to all of the tiny, beautiful, wonderful things in the ordinary. The little things of the little tiny joys, the moments that make us pause, that were hidden all in plain sight. So despite all the darkness, despite all the death, despite of the dearth of the season of the pandemic and the season of burnout, I wanted to really explore this question. How could I focus on the teeny tiny joys hidden all over the place, embedded into my everyday routines, embedded into the mundanity of the everyday world? And what would it look like if I were to really explore that? So I challenged myself for one year, to experiment with this perspective. What if I were to play around with intentionally finding the joys in plain sight and then figuring out how to capture them? A few key moments stand out. There was a house fire a couple of streets away from me. This is not the house fire, but it actually, the remains looked very similar to this. I thought about how watching that house burn, how I had also watched and smelled the California wildfires ravage the mountains and how dangerous that was. And then despite all of that death, despite all of that destruction, a little tiny lemon tree ended up popping up in the yard of the charred remains of the house. What is that a signal of? Life after death. I also thought about what does it look like to revel in the slowness of the moments that my cats drink in. They drink up time like it's an infinite resource. In fact, my cat Charlie right now, who's actually this little guy here, he's laying across the couch. He looks exactly like this, y'all. He's completely passed out. He's just drinking in this experience of me talking to my living room now. 
What could that slowness teach me? I paid attention to that. I paid attention to what if there was a lesson I could uncover in washing the dishes? Again, something that most of us do every day, something that's usually really mundane and boring and not fun. But maybe there was a lesson hidden there in plain sight. I paid attention to small things like freckles on my partner's skin, weaving stories behind the little marks that would compose the history for our relationship. All these tiny treasures were vast and abound. And I had to look. So this brings us to this framework of what would it feel like to pay deliberate attention despite our attention economy, you know, having all of these interruptions, making it so hard to focus. Despite all of that, how could we still celebrate all the wondrous little moments in the ordinary? Then that became my framework. That became my framework largely in part to a text. In June of 2020, so a year ago, a year and some change ago, I received a text from one of my best, best friends saying, hey, I just heard about this program called the Creator Institute, and it's a program where you get to write a book in a year. You should do it with me. I'm like, well, I'm not one to back down from a challenge. That sounds hella hard and hella fun. Let's go, let's try it out. Because by that point, I realized that I had to dig myself out of this creative rut. I hadn't been writing. I hadn't been creating. What would it look like for me to in, um, intentionally dig myself out? So I wanted to explore this creative institute. And what drew me to it is the fact that it was a hybrid publisher. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I had no idea about the world of book writing, about the world of book publishing. I'm curious to hear, are any of us here either writers or aspiring writers or have friends in our circle who are writers or authors. Yeah, yeah. Joanna mentioned to me before the call that uh, one of her good friends just published a book. Yes, Nick's definitely an aspiring writer. All these, we, we know people. Uh, Stanford, I see you, I hear you. It's kind of like, wow, how are they doing it? And I was in that same boat. How are these people writing and publishing books? I want to know. And so what I was familiar with was the traditional writing model, right? You hopefully get an agent, you submit your manuscript, you go off to things like Penguin or Random House with the hopes that they accept your manuscript and publish you. And that's a huge deal. We also don't get a lot of royalties. I'm like, hmm, that doesn't sound ideal. Or there's also the self-publishing route, which you publish your manuscript, uh, you can edit it as much or as little as you like, and it's out there and it's beautiful. Like, well, I want to make sure that my work is pretty good. I, I don't trust myself a hundred thousand percent to be able to edit it because I'm not a professional editor. So it's like this hybrid publishing model sounds really good. What if I get a team of editors and a team of supporters who can help me understand the ins and outs of the writing process and still be able to maintain the royalties of a published work? So this Creator Institute just happened to come into my world and I liken it to serendipity. It's those little tiny accidents that just in the nick of time slip by into us and we grab them. Interestingly, that text that my, my one of my uh, good friends sent came on the last day of the application deadline to this program. So serendipity at an all-time high. I talked to the program director. I was like, I want to write this book. He's like, great. What are you writing about? I'm like, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I've been toying around this idea of wonder in the ordinary, but I have no clue how to put it together. Now, he and a, a mentor of mine, I remember hearing this piece of advice about writing, which was, write what you know. I knew that. I knew that I went on daily walks. I knew that I tried to force myself to pay attention to the little things. What would it look like for me to make that a full-fledged book? Now, folks, the overall structure, in case this is of interest to anyone here on the call or watching the recording, the overall structure of this year of writing was that the first five months were dedicated to pure writing. You just got those thoughts out onto paper from your head. In the first draft, I ended up having about 32-ish thousand words. I'm like, that's good enough. Five, thousand, five months, 32,000 words. I can live with that. Then came the hard part. Because this was a, uh, because this was a hybrid publishing model, authors were ex expected to crowdfund and sort of fund the book. That would go to funding the editors, the copy editors, the proofreaders, the cover designers, all of the team members who made this book a reality. And we'll talk about the difficulties of crowdfunding in a bit. Then, the two hardest months of this entire process. At first, I thought writing was hard. And then came the editing. 
I was like, oh my gosh, to be able to go through the manuscript seven times, to have to write, rewrite, be told that, hey, your story sucks. Like, this is not a good story. I was like, wow, that stinks. And that stings. So let me rewrite it and make it better. Then came all of the sprucing up. How do I make sure that the grammar is right? How do I make sure that there's no punctuation errors? How do I make sure that the cover design is actually something that attracts people, both visually, both kind of from an emotional perspective? So I had a team help me with that. Uh, Pre-launch came next for a whole month of gathering all of the resources, the materials to make sure that this book was going to be out. And then most recently, the book came out in May and June. The digital version was in May. It was a staggered approach. And the physical version was in June. I will pause here because I've just thrown out a lot of information. I'll pause for questions regarding this structure and why it was organized this way. Anything coming up for folks on the structure of this program and the structure of the year of writing? Great. I it seems like my... they're... Oh. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just to say my one friend that just published her book, um, I think she started, started maybe five years ago and it, the first book didn't work out and she went to a different angle. And so it, yeah, it, it was a lot of work. And then now she's in the process of a second book um, and she's feeling a lot of pressure to do it a lot quicker. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's interesting how it worked out for her. Yeah, yeah. And Joanna, that experience of your friend is actually quite common for authors that it's a year long, years long process, right? Because life gets in the way because I mean, writing a book is really hard. And um, I'll share that. If I were to do this again, probably wouldn't do it in a year because that was, I'll share That's some fast. of the challenges <laughs> and the difficulties that arose, right? Taking a more measured, a longer approach, probably a better way to go. So thank you for sharing that and showing the different ways that authors can can come to light. Nick, I believe I heard your voice. Yeah, I was just going to say the the structure of this seems like it's over a, a really constrained timeline, which you know a, a year is a pretty short amount of time for any kind of serious creative project. Mm -hmm. um, I also see like five months of this is dedicated to the writing itself. Like, did you did you think up front that um, that that was going to be the share of writing and then so much time was going to be spent on on these other things and the logistics of it the crowdfunding and all that yeah great question so i think one of the the perks and the drawbacks of this program is that they told us only as much as we needed to know in the process i wasn't aware that there was going to be all these months of editing the copy editing proofreading the pre-launch they were like just just keep it local keep your attention local and so i um wish I had known the full structure, the full scope, but I also wonder if that might've freaked me out because it would have been a lot to absorb all at once. So the short answer is no, was not really aware of this, but luckily I had a support team who kind of guided me along the way. And Tati, to your question of, do you need to have a solid idea when joining the program? No. Solid is, you know, up for interpretation. So as long as there's some sort of seed, I want to write a young adult novel. I want to write a nonfiction book. I want to write a um, fantasy. As long as that seed is there, that's enough. Because to your second question, as you wrote in the first five months, did you get any support or feedback? Yes. There is someone called the developmental editor who reads every single portion, every single chapter that authors submit in order to be able to give immediate in the moment feedback on what the structure is, right? How do we organize this from a macro perspective? And that was really helpful, but I also didn't read the feedback that my DE developmental editor wrote for the first five months because I was like, I need to just write and then look at the feedback. Does that help? Does that help answer the question? Tatiana? Cool, yeah, it's definitely very exciting and challenging and all of these other adjectives for sure. And so I, I want to transition us now to looking at the nitty gritty. We talked about the high level structure. Now I want to share a little bit about the behind the scenes of writing habits. Now, several of us raised our hands or our virtual hands of knowing authors of kind of being in this, this reader writer circle, but I intuit that based on us being humans in 2022 and based on the sheer amount of writing that we all ourselves do, that we probably have some writing habits already. How do we construct an email? How do we construct a pitch? How do we construct a report? 
I want to share a little bit about the writing habits that I used for my book. And then I want to hear some of the writing habits that you all have so that we can learn from one another. Two main things come to light. The first behind the scenes writing habit is that I thought that it would be a good idea to write on the weekends. I work a full-time job like many of us. So, you know, 40 plus hours a week of really intense facilitation, actually much like this. So I would facilitate to managers and executives all day. I'm like, ah, it's six o'clock in the evening. Got to work out, got to relax. I'll just write on the weekends. Guess how long that idea lasted? Two weeks. Because I realized I wasn't meeting my writing goals. Every week we had concrete writing goals that we needed to meet such that we wouldn't fall behind on the program structure. And I realized by the time the weekend rolled around, I didn't want to write. I wanted to relax. I was too tired. I wanted to hang out with friends. Writing was definitely the last thing on my mind. So like, whoa, 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 things have to change. How can I create a writing habit that feels sustainable? So I thought to myself, what if I experiment with, and the key word is experiment because it took me a lot of times, uh, a lot of experimentation to really get it right. What if I could wake up maybe half an hour earlier before work, write a little bit then because I know myself, I'm really fresh in the mornings and maybe come back to it in the evening for another two or three hours. That seemed to be a little bit more manageable because of chunking, right? When we chunk work into smaller parts, we reduce that cognitive load and it feels a little bit more manageable. So that worked for a bit. And then I realized I was doing this every day, seven days a week. Now, if we work seven days a week, is that a recipe for thriving? No, right? We already talked about some of the things that are so important in ourselves and our lives as thriving individuals is having the space to spend time with our loved ones, having the time to go on vacation, to spend time with people that matter to us. That actually fell to the wayside. So what I realized far too late in the process was to actually take a Saturday off. Now I know, mind blowing, right? Take the weekend to relax, to unwind, to not do work. But it took me until the second to last week of the editing process, which means I was eight months in to actually say, Katya, do not work on Saturdays. You're already working on Sunday. You're already working Monday through Friday. Take the gosh darn day off on Saturday so you can actually be a person, a human being, not a human doing. So two writing habits there. I'll, I'll share one more. One is uh, more about chunking of what happens if you have a really arduous goal. There were several weeks where in four days, I had to write 5,000 words. Now, y'all, that's a lot. Like I know writers and full-time authors do this on the regular. They're like, yeah, I can knock out, you know, 3,000 words in a day. That is not me. Can't do that. So how do we navigate 5,000 words in four days? Simply breaking it down into smaller chunks into days of 12 to 1,300 words was really helpful. And then setting my mindset to say, okay, Katya, like these next four days are probably going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be working full-time and you're going to be writing. It's probably going to suck, but you're going to do this. Thanks so much, Julie. So great to have you. Enjoy your gymnastics time. Take care. Bye. And so that chunking was a really nice way to break a huge project down into smaller components so that it felt a little bit more bite-sized. Now, I'm curious to hear from some of our brilliant writers here, and I call everyone writers because we write at least in some capacity here. Kevin, I'm so glad to hear you. Uh, Kevin's joining us. Welcome, Kevin. It's wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much for joining. We are now talking about writing habits, what it means to establish writing habits as an author. I'm curious to crowdsource some ideas from the room. What is a writing habit that resonates with you, either from the ones that I just shared or from the writing habits that you've implemented in your own work? Feel free to either chat it out or call it out. Either is great. Ooh, we see Tatiana Pomodoros a lot. Tatiana, would you mind sharing with us what that means? Sure. Um, so Pomodoro is a technique where you work for 25 minutes uninterrupted and then you take five minute breaks in between. Mm -hmm. And I find that, especially as I'm doing a lot of brain work, Sometimes it works for me to actually uh, flex the 25 to 50 minutes and then 10 minute breaks. So I tend to work 50 minutes of uninterrupted writing time and then 10 minutes of break. 
my one rule is not to edit. Like I cannot read what I wrote in those 50 minutes because mm-hmm. I find that that distracts me from the task at hand. Yeah. So when I'm writing, I'm writing. When I'm editing, I'm editing, but I'm never doing the two things at the same time. Mm, I love that. So we're not multitasking. We're not judging our work right mm-hmm. then and there. Our whole goal is just to write. Exactly. Divergent thinking versus uh, <laughs> concrete yes. thinking. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's such a great tip. Whether again, we're doing this for creatively, professionally, maybe even writing code. Curious to hear from maybe one or two more folks. What other writing habits in any writing capacity that you have do you use? Oh yeah. Joanna turns off and closes email and phone that full focus, right? Because remember back to our distractions, all the news, all the pings, the notifications, they're those little pernicious things that take away our attention. So garnering, garnering that full fledged focus. Absolutely. Y'all, I should have crowdsourced with you all before I began writing, because these are excellent tips that I found about way too late through trial and error. Any other writing tips that we have for a brilliant team here? For me, I'll take two kind of, uh two opposite approaches like one one or the other just depending on the situation of the day and one is just to uh, just to go for it just do complete stream of consciousness do everything about writing except thinking about the subject that you're writing on Mm -hmm. Uh, which which is a great way it's kind of like stretches before before you go on a run Mm -hmm. Uh, the the other one is just kind of a creative placement of constraints. So for um, for code, for music, for for more like structured kinds of writing, you know, there I'll I'll just lay out some some arbitrary rules about the environment that I'm writing in. Like this is a word that I can't use. This is a subject that I can't go to. This is you know a chord that I you know have to, to use this many times in this kind of sequence or the opposite. Um, just to try to take advantage of the fact that that um, constraint is the you know necessity is the mother of invention and constraints are the the mother of like ingenuity to mm-hmm. to figure out a way you know through through the smallest crack that I can design for myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that Nick. Constraint is the mother of ingenuity. I want to quote you on that. And very similar to Danielle's answer in the chat of using outlines, making sure the thoughts connect on this big macro level, right? Within the constraints of this macro level to ensure that we don't have little stragglers or outlines. What a great way to, I like to think of it as a big umbrella, right? How can we organize these ideas under this giant umbrella? Folks, y'all are writers. I love what I'm hearing here. It's incredible to be able to share these ideas and discourse with you because again, wish I had y'all when I began the process. So back to these writing habits, right? Establishing concrete routines, making it time-based, using Pomodoros, having some sort of numerical goal, having a clear outline or direction of where we're going. All of these went into writing this book. And all of these are things that you're already doing. So amazing to hear that this is happening for us here. Now I want to pivot a little bit and explain that beyond all these habits, beyond all of the intention to create a positive writing journey, there were, of course, a lot of difficult things in the process. One of the hardest things for me as a social person, as an ambivert nowadays, is establishing boundaries and saying no. This looks in the perspective of saying no to friends, saying no to date nights, saying no to going out for drinks or to have fun. Instead saying, I got to write, I have a deadline this week. And that was one of the hardest things. Because then your social support kind of fell away. You bird yourself into the into this hermit world of writing. And y'all, it actually felt very isolating. And that's one of the things that uh, I found very curious about the writing process because it's like, oh, I'm totally going to write and be uh, have fun about it. And it became ironic that the very thing that I was writing about, joy, seemed so scarce in my life. I became a kind of miserable person during this process. And again, I'm sharing this in all transparency because I want to illustrate the fact that this shit's hard, y'all. And the irony was just unmatched. And I'm writing a book about something so happy, something so joyous, all the wondrous little moments while kind of being down in the dumps, just trying to get through my word count goal. One of the other hard things about this process is that because this is hybrid publishing, there is the crowdfunding element. 
which means on the left-hand side here, having to raise money, a significant amount of money, at least to me, in order to be able to fund the book in advance. Now, if we think about this, the book wasn't out yet. I wasn't actually saying, hey, I just wrote a book. I need your money to help me support it. It was just a seed of an idea. I went around telling people, hey, my goal is to really think about how we can make this joyful world come to life. And I'm curious, would you be open to supporting my dream of writing this book on joy? Luckily, a lot of people said yes. And the hardest part, though, was asking of putting myself out there saying like, hey, would you like to support this dream? So got fully funded, which was incredible. And then the other side of the social beast, which was to actually be social, to have a social media account. Now, folks, a lot of us have Facebook, Instagram, other LinkedIn accounts where we post our thoughts, where we read other people's thoughts. And now having to do it almost professionally, that was tough because I don't like spending my life on Instagram. It's, it's kind of a, it's hard for me in this act of self-promotion saying, hey, look at what I did. Look at what I did. Come check out my book. That was very hard as an author. Carol, welcome. So lovely to have you here. We're talking about the difficulties, some, some of the difficulties in the writing journey. It's a delight to have you here. So folks, in all of this hardship and all of the kind of ups and downs of the writing journey, a familiar picture came to light. This person, again, tendrils of burnout began reaching their pernicious grasp and kind of it was not a fun time. This last year was probably the hardest year of my life, just trying to balance full-time work, a pandemic, uh, writing a book and navigating all the complexity that we have in this world. And I remember just being it being 11, 12 o'clock at night for seven days a week, where I'd still be in front of the computer, where I'd be glued to a 13 inch screen. And that was as far as kind of my, my life uh, was. That was very hard. Elvin asks, do you wish the deadlines were more flexible? Elvin, Elvin, that's a great question. Yes and no. I wish I had more time just to be able to balance things and be a person, but I also am so glad that they weren't. And I'm also glad that's in the past because the process might have just dragged on out. It's kind of like the concept of your work will take up as much time as you give it. So it's like, let me just, let me put those boundaries up specifically so I get it done and then move on. And then if it's not a thousand percent perfect, I'll settle for 999%. But in this phase of burnout, I remember thinking to myself, why the hell am I still doing this? I don't feel joyful. I feel kind of devoid of color. I feel exactly how I felt at the start of the pandemic, which spurred me to think about joy. What's happening here? It got so kind of, uh, kind of bad that I took advantage of my organization's free therapist call. We have three calls to therapists as part of their employee assistance program. Like, why not? Let me just take the shot in the dark. Let me talk to a mental health professional because I was struggling. And so I'm on the phone with her and I'm venting to her about all the things that I had to do. I was like, I have to do this. I have to do that. I still have to get to back to work and I'm gonna be up to 11 or 12 tonight as I was the last night, as I was the night before. Why is this happening? She asked me, Katya, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? Why are you writing this book? Why does this matter? And that question kind of stopped me in, in, in my tracks because I'm like, why am I doing this? Why does this matter? Why am I embarking on this journey that's so hard that really usurps all of my energy and time and leads me to feeling burnt out? And it matters because of this. Images that friends send holding the book in their hands. Texts from coworkers that say, this hit me so hard. Where a piece of an experience, in, in this case, I was talking about the immigrant parental experience, that resonated with this person. It's because of comments like this. These short stories and thoughts begin to condition us to notice the joys in our own life. What a gift to be able to change the thinking, or at least the orientation around thinking of where joy can be present in other people's lives. 
It's from an Amazon customer, not sure who this is, that says, I find myself coming back to the book for a new fresh take on what it means to live purposefully and happily. Now, y'all, if that's not a gift, if that's not what makes it all worth it, I don't know what is. Because the real answer of why I'm doing this is because there is power in human stories. When we put ourselves out there, when we share so vulnerably about some of the things that make us human, about the things that make us human beings, not human doings, by noticing the tiny joys, by observing the wonder, by being able to share it vulnerably with others, that's how we build the bridges of connection. That's how these little simple words on a page are able to hopefully reach out to the reader's eyes and say, I hear you, I see you, I see you in your experience. That was my overall goal for the book, just to have an experiment where I go around demarcating these short stories, essays on those little tiny human moments hidden all over the place in our everyday world, in our everyday lives, and get a chance to share it with others. So that led me back to zooming out, to asking an even more bigger and perhaps more important question. If there is power in sharing these human stories of joy, of wonder in the ordinary, then what if we could create a more joyful world together? What if we as readers, as folks here on this call, as folks who are listening to this recording, how can we plug in to establishing this joyful orientation all around us? And this is where I want to share with you the takeaway. The takeaway is this treasure hunt framework. Now here's how it works. This is something that I've been thinking about. How do I kind of spread this idea to folks such that they can have something tangible to take away with them? The treasure hunt framework is as follows. In our human lives, the way that we live them is based largely on assumptions. What we assume to be true is the way that colors our perceptions. For example, if we assume that most people are good, chances are we're probably going to meet a lot of really good, kind people. Now, similarly, what if we were to assume there were tiny, infinite treasures, all those tiny little joys, hidden everywhere in our everyday world, hidden in plain sight? And then it becomes our job to be these little treasure hunters, to say, okay, I can assume that there is something to be joyful or happy about today. I'm just going to make that assumption a lived reality for me. Now, how can I find it? So this treasure hunt framework allows us to put on the identity of treasure hunters to say, I believe it to be true. I choose to believe it to be true, that there is something joyful about my day. Even if it's the longest, hardest, messiest, most depressing day, what if there is that little sparkle in the mundane? So let's try it out for ourselves. I'm going to invite us to, in the chat once again, focus on just your day today. It is Wednesday, June 22nd. At the top of the hour, y'all shared one of your joys from the last several weeks. I want to localize that same question. What was one tiny joy or treasure that you found today? Please share your answers into the chat. I'll read it out loud for our audio learners. I'll give us about 20 or so seconds to do so. Really take the time to share with us one tiny joy or treasure from your day to day. Mm. Folks, take a moment to scroll up and down. I'll share the responses here. Joanna's tiny joy was fresh bagel and cream cheese from Wexler's. That sounds amazing. I'm putting that place on my list. Charlotte had a really great lunch from Eco Kitchen in downtown LA. Sanford, so kind, this talk. I'm, I'm so blessed uh, to hear you say that. Thank you. Tatiana was able to set up a TV box and really proud to do it by herself. Amazing accomplishment. Folks, are you noticing any themes coming up from the answers in the chat? Any themes, any commonalities between these answers? Free to shout it out, drop it in the chat. 
Yeah. Mundane. I like to think of it. It's the everyday. It's stuff that we do. We get lunch. We set things up for our home. We attend conversations. It's part of regular life. Exactly. So in the span of today, we had largely an average day, I would think. In the span of today, we're still able to find something that brings us joy, that allows us to pause for a tiny little moment and appreciate all the beautiful things in the ordinary. And so that leads us to the question of why does this matter? Why is it important to deliberately find the joys in the everyday? The reason it matters is because we can train our brains to seek out the positive. And this is not to say, oh, you know, my life's all rainbows and butterflies. I'm always going to be on the positive side of things. I'm always going to find the silver linings because y'all, that's not reasonable. We're humans. We have things that get us really, really down. But the whole goal here is to, despite all of the difficulty, despite all of the nuttiness, the craziness, the noisiness of our world, to be able to have the identity of treasure hunting for the little tiny things that are already embedded into our everyday mind. And that way we can build habits of positive, joyful living, of habits that roll up into more thriving life. So in sum, my overall goal with this is to really help other folks find their own joy in plain sight. And I'll share that right now I'm on a uh, sort of a bend to try to go around to various organizations and teams to share this type of treasure hunt framework to help other folks build that joyful living habit perspective. Because habits are the key things that are going to make them stick. Also, I'm uh, on a circuit to give more professional talks. If Y'all know of uh, folks in your circle who might be looking for a professional speaker. If you prefer a more one-to-one -one interaction, I'm also booking clients for private coaching calls to unpack all of the nitty gritty behind our everydays and see where we can insert that joy habit, where it might make sense to you. So if that's something that resonates with you or someone that you know, I encourage you to let me know, to connect with me, to uh, let me know how you're building your own joys in plain sight. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is by talking about it, by socializing it, is we are creating a more joyful world. And if that's not a life well lived, I don't know what is. Folks, I'm going to share these links into the chat because I know it can be difficult to grab them. So let me go ahead and do that now. Drop a thing, dropping them in the chat, you're welcome to grab them from there. But I will officially pause here and I want to first give us a little bit of a wrap up of the key ideas uh, that kind of keep us here, where the power of human stories is not to be understated, where if we share those tiny little joyful moments as treasure hunters, we are well on our way to creating a more joyful world. And one of my joys, one of the most shining parts of my day today was spending this hour here with you. So I want to thank you all tremendously for being here, for gifting me the, uh, the, the gift of your time and your presence during this hour. And for those watching the recording, thank you so much for being here. I would love to continue this conversation. Please reach out, but I'm also, I also love to take questions now. So thanks so much for sharing this experience with me, y'all. If you have questions, always happy to, to discuss. What questions come up for us? When you do it again, how are you going to do it different? I love that you said when you do it again and not if, because that's that's one of the most common questions that people ask. Okay, when's when's your next book? I'm like, well, let me take a break first. Let me take a breather. I think next time I want to be knowing the process now from this perspective, I think I want to be a little bit more intentional about deliberately putting in social time into my week. There were some weeks where I did not see my friends. And that was really, really tough. So saying, okay, every Thursday or every other Saturday, I will deliberately spend that time with friends. That can really be a source of energy. Um, so thank you for asking that question. I think a lot more intentionality behind carving out places where I can recharge and re-energize. Thanks for asking. Patty, thank you for your comment in the chat of uh, the Aldi episode. I, in one of the chapters, I'll share that I write about the grocery store Aldi. Being an immigrant to the United States when I was a kid, you know, we didn't really have much growing up. So I remember marveling at this grocery store Aldi. 
And I still marvel to this day, you know, decades, decades later of just little things, having all of the choices of all the different nuts, all the different kinds of chocolate. It's so readily available. How can I revel in it and then buy and eat all of it, of course. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Other questions, reflections, thoughts? Amazing. Well, friends, it has been a true honor to spend this time to you all. Um, similar to Walgreens, is it a grocery store, a pharmacy? Yeah, that, that immigrant experience, right? There's just an abundance of all of these things that we can take the time to appreciate. <laughs> If you'd like to continue this conversation, and I would, so for, for one, I would love to be able to have these uh, future conversations with you. Please feel free to reach out my, uh, for the folks who didn't get the, the chat, you're welcome to find me on Instagram at, at joy in plain sight, connect with me on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Katia Davidova. My website's the same thing, katiadavidova.com. Please send me a message. I would be so, so over the moon to connect with you, hear how joy shows up in your life. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I appreciate y'all immensely. Katya, that was so lovely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll start my book soon. <laughs> Amazing. Um, y'all, thank you so much for your time. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I was just going to throw one thing in the chat. Well, two things, because we've got two events coming up. The Marine Mammal Care Center that I mentioned at the beginning. And then Julie Lee, who was here earlier, who had to leave to go to gymnastics. She's the president of the Orange County um, chapter. And she mentioned there's a book club coming up there too. So if you like to be part of book clubs, what's great is it's virtual. So you don't have to be in Orange County for it. So that's coming up. Um, I think that's in June as well, maybe early July. So I just wanted to share that. But again, Katya, thank you so much. This is absolutely lovely. Mm -hmm. Katya, for all, you all that don't know, Katya reached out to me back in like November and was like, hey, I want to share this book I'm writing with the UVA community. I was like, awesome, let's figure out how to do this. So we've been chatting about it for a while and um, her book just physically came out. So we're like, let's try to do it around that time. So now you can all see it, which is fantastic. Yes. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining and hope to see you all at the next event, hopefully in person too. Amazing. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.